Next lesson in this unit is going to be rotation three. In this lesson, we're going to look at two new topics dealing with rotation of objects, uh, rotational kinetic energy and angular momentum. So first, rotational kinetic energy. So, you know, we've talked about before objects have kinetic energy due to their motion. So, you know, we've done cases where we've had, you know, a box that's sliding at some, uh, some speed um, right here has some mass and that we'd say then the kinetic energy of that would be one half mv squared, you know, as our, our kinetic energy here. But that's kinetic energy that's in a linear direction. And so uh, we call it kinetic energy here. We're actually going to rename it slightly. We're going to make it linear kinetic energy now because it deals with motion in a direction because we also have, as we said, rotating objects. Rotating objects have kinetic energy due to their rotation. Um, the faster they rotate, we'd expect they'd have a higher rotational kinetic energy. Um, and so if we actually want to look at the equation itself, we've got it down here. Rotational kinetic energy is equal to one-half I omega squared. And so you once again, you see this analog between these two. We have the one-half out here, just like we have the one-half in our linear kinetic energy. Instead of mass and linear kinetic energy, we have moment of inertia. And instead of velocity, we have angular velocity uh, for rotational kinetic energy. So um, that's basically sort of how this equation works. Is so anything that's spinning, if we know how fast it's spinning, that's our omega. Uh, it's rotational rate, uh, rotational or its angular velocity. The faster it spins, the higher the rotational kinetic energy. We know that the higher the moment of inertia. So if you have two objects that are spinning at the same rate that have the same value of omega, one has a high moment of inertia, one has a low moment of inertia, uh, the one with a higher moment of inertia would have a higher rotational kinetic energy. Just like if you have two objects that are moving at the same speed, uh, at the same velocity, uh, the one with a higher mass would have the higher linear kinetic energy. Uh, so it works sort of the same way. So for rotational kinetic energy, let's work out an example of this. So a uh, five kilogram rod of length 2.0 meters is spun around its center at a rate of 1.5 rotations a second. Uh, what's the rotational kinetic energy that it has? So we have some rod um, right here. And so we got some rod right here. We are going to uh, spin this rod about its center. And so that's going to be our rotation axis. Um, we know that the rod has a mass of 5 kilograms, 5.0 kg. It has a length of 2 meters. Okay, so its length there is going to be 2 meters. And so this is our setup here. We know, the question is, what's the rotational kinetic energy? Well, rotational kinetic energy, uh, RKE, as we said, is going to be 1 half I omega squared. So we need to figure out the angular, uh, sorry, the moment of inertia I, and we figure out the angular um, velocity omega. So for I, for a rod spun around its center, it tells us uh, the moment of inertia is ML squared over 12. So let's put that in. So the mass of the rod is 5 kilograms. Uh, it's in the right unit. It should be in kilograms, and it is in kilograms. The length of the rod is 2 meters. So we say 2 meters squared divided by 12 right here. And so we can do the math. Uh, 2 squared is 4 times 5 is 20. 20 divided by 12, let's see, is 1 and 2 thirds. So that'd be 1.667. 6667. Uh, remember, units of moment of inertia are kilogram meters squared. Okay, so we have the moment of inertia here. Next thing we need to figure out to find rotational kinetic energy is omega, the uh, angular velocity, and so uh, that's radians per second. So omega is radians per second. So how many radians does this go? And so it says 1.5 rotations. Well, rotation is 2 pi radians, so then our number of radians is going to be uh, 1.5 times 2 pi. And then divided by the number of seconds here, and it says that's a second, so it's in one second right here. So uh, once again, we can sort of do the math. 2.5, or 1.5 times 2 pi is 9.4278, and divided by 1 would be the same thing, because that's one second down there. So omega, as we said, is going to be uh, 9.42, 9.42478 uh, radians per second. Okay. And so now we have to do is just plug it into our rotational kinetic energy equation. So we'll just continue that guy out over here. And so one half moment of inertia, which we found to be 1.6667. Okay, times the uh, angular velocity 9.42, 9.42478. Uh, radians per second. 
and then quantity squared because of the fact that it's omega squared. And so we can once again just do the math on here and find our rotational kinetic energy. And so rotational kinetic energy in this case uh, should be 74.022 joules will be our unit here, just the same way that other ones are. They're using these units of uh, kilograms in here, meters for the length right here. So we have, as we said, kilogram meters per second, meters squared is the unit we want of moment of inertia. And using radians per second for omega gives us a unit of joules for rotational kinetic energy. Sig fig wise, we have two sig figs here, two sig figs here. Uh, two sig figs for our mass right here, so it'll be, we're doing multi multiplication bit division, so this will be two overall. So rotational kinetic energy uh, would equal 74 joules for this rotating rod. And so that would be how you'd go about finding a basic rotational kinetic energy equation. So um, looking at this in sort of the bigger picture, you know, rotational kinetic energy is used in energy calculations the exact same way we've used linear kinetic energy, we've used gravitational potential energy, and we've used spring potential energy. You know, we sum all of these up to find the total energy of the object. Now we just added something new that's on here. So um, rolling objects possess both linear kinetic energy and rotational kinetic energy. You know, this is uh, the fact that the rolling objects also have this, this um, this rotational kinetic energy is the reason why, I don't know if you've noticed this, but as we've done problems, we have all sorts of inclines, and the natural thing you expect to put down inclines are things that roll, but we've never done rolling objects. We've always done boxes sliding down inclines and things that are sliding, not things that are rolling. And the reason why is because we'd have to consider this rotational kinetic energy if we were talking about rolling objects. And we've never discussed it until now. And so now we can start talking about that. So, you know, if I have some object that's rolling at the top of the incline, starts off with gravitational potential energy as it starts moving down the incline by the time it you know moves along later here it's going to be moving in a direction and so it's going to have linear kinetic energy that's going to be due to that amount here it doesn't have a direction to it it's a it's a scalar but it's due to that motion here but then it's also going to be rotating as it goes around here and due to the rotation it's going to have rotational kinetic energy and we have to sum those up to find our total energy so um, let's Let's just look at a, an example. Let's look at actually probably this one right here, um, where we have something going down a, uh, an incline like this. So we have a solid sphere of mass 0.5 kilograms and radius 25 centimeters is rolled down a three meter high incline. So we have an incline. We're told that it's uh, three meters is the height of the incline right here. We have our object, our, our sphere that's right up here. And so it says that the sphere has a, uh, a radius right there of um, 25 centimeters. We want that in meters, so we'll put 0.25 meters is equal to radius. Uh, the mass of the object uh, would be equal to, it says, is 0.5 kilogram. So 0 0.50 kilograms is the mass, so we have that. As it uh, rolls down this incline, um, it's going to pick up not only linear velocity, but it's also going to pick up angular velocity, so it'll have linear kinetic energy and angular kinetic energy as it rolls. And the question is, how fast is the sphere moving when it reaches the bottom? So, um, you know, this is basically a work energy pr theory problem. So, you know, with a work energy theorem, the final energy is equal to the original energy plus the work. And so that's our general setup here. So let's look and see what we can figure out. You know, at the, uh, the beginning, it's going to be our original energy is that uh, it's going to definitely have gravitational potential energy at that point. Um, it's not moving yet, so it has no linear kinetic energy. It's not rotating yet, so it has no rotational kinetic energy. There are no springs involved, so that's not here. So really, it should only have gravitational potential energy at the beginning. At the end, when it gets to the bottom of the incline, it has, probably if we're doing this, we'd set our height to be at the bottom of the incline, so it would have no gravitational potential energy. It would have linear kinetic energy because it is moving when it gets to the bottom in a linear direction. It would have rotational kinetic energy because of the fact that it um, is rotating at the bottom. Once again, no springs involved, so we don't have to worry about that. So we sort of have an idea of what we're going to put in for our final energy. That'll be the linear kinetic and rotational kinetic. We have an idea on what we're going to put around for our original energy. That should be just gravitational potential. As this roll down, we're not worried about a frictional force or any other outside forces, which means that when we do this, uh, we know that work is going to end up being zero here, and so that our original and final energy should be the same. So let's see how this works out. So um, with an original energy, we said is going to be equal to the gravitational potential it starts with, which is just going to be mgh. And so original energy here would be the mass of the object, which is 0 0.5, yeah, 0 0.5 kilograms. So 0.5 kilograms, 
6.50 technically, times uh, g, which is 9.8, assuming this is on Earth, meters per second squared. The height on here is 3.0 meters. So I'll say it's three, 3 meters right here. And doing that gives us an original energy of 0.5 times 9.8 times 3, that's just 14.7 joules. So it starts off 14.7 joules. It should end with 14.7 joules as well uh, because of the fact there's no work being done on the system. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at this final energy. So the final energy we said is made up of linear kinetic energy and rotational kinetic energy. So linear kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared uh, plus the rotational kinetic energy, which is 1 half i omega squared. So let's see what we know about this. So, um, you know, m we've got, v we've got, um, i uh, we don't have. So we're going to need to figure out what is the um, moment of inertia for this sphere. It tells us the equation for it, 2mr squared over 5. And so we find that moment of inertia, that should be uh, 2 fifths, pull the 5 out there, times the mass, which is 0.5 kilograms, times the radius of the sphere, which is 0.25 meters, because I have to have that in meters squared. And so, uh, once again, we can just do the math on this. 2 fifths times 0.5 is going to be 0.1 times uh, 0.25 squared. That's 1 16th. So 0.1 divided by 1600. And then we head writes about 0.0125. Put 0 0.0125 uh, units still kilogram meters squared for our units right there. We put the mass in kilograms and the radius in meters. Good. So that's the right unit that we want right there. All right. So now that we know this, we can go ahead and start doing a little bit more, but actually there's one other step we can do. We know we've got this omega that we're looking for, but really we don't, if we plug in what we've got here, we'll have two variables. We'll have V and we'll have omega. We'd really rather just have one because we can't solve this with two. And so there is another other piece that we know, and we know that there's a relationship between uh, the, the linear velocity and the angular velocity, and that's that the, the, the linear velocity is equal to omega r. And so, you know, let's go ahead and try to substitute for omega here so that we can solve this for v, because that's what we're looking for, how fast the sphere moving, that's a linear velocity. And so divide both sides here by r, and so that we get, r's cancel off, we get that omega is equal to v over r. And so we can go ahead and take that and plug that in for omega up here, and then let this simplify out a little bit. So um, let's plug this into our work energy theorem. So final, um, energy equals original energy plus work. The work is zero. So final energy uh, is what we're working out here. So final energy is going to be um, one half mv squared. So that would be one half the mass, which is, we said, 0.5 times the velocity squared. We don't know that. Plus the rotational kinetic energy, one half i. Well, we already figured out i was 0 0.0125. 0 0.0125 times omega squared, but we're going to do that substitution because we found omega is v over r. So v, we don't know, over the radius, which we do, is 0.25 quantity squared. And so this should be equal to the original energy, which we found was 14.7 joules, uh, plus the work, which is zero, and so it's just that. So now we have an equation we can solve. We just have one variable, v. And so let's go ahead and simplify it. One half times 0.5 is just 0.25 v squared plus, uh, let's see, let's go to the math, 1 half times 0 0.0125 divided by 0.25 squared, as we distribute that squared throughout that term, that's the v squared over 0.25. We do that, that comes out to be right at 0.1. So we get 0.1 times v squared equals 14.7. Uh, just combine these two terms together, 0.25 plus 0.1 is 0.35. So 0.35 v squared equals 14.7 joules. Divide both sides by 0 0.35, 0 0.35, cancels out over here, v squared, uh, let's see, 14.7 divided by 0 0.35 comes out to be 42, and then square root of both the sides here, and so the velocity ends up being a 6 point, uh, let's see, round this to 2 sig figs, yeah, 2 sig figs, so 6.5 meters per second. And so that would be the speed of the ball when it gets to the bottom, if it's rotating. So this is something to watch out for. Anytime you have a rotating object that is, um, that's rolling, that uh, you do have to consider both the rotational kinetic energy and the linear kinetic energy when you're working out problems. So 
Um, next thing we want to look at is angular momentum. So the angular momentum of an object is the angular analog to linear momentum. You know, and just as the linear momentum of a system of objects is conserved if there's no outside force, the angular momentum of a system of objects is conserved if there is no outside torque. Because, you know, torque is the analog with force. And so, you know, this is basically, you know, if you are this, you can sort of see this a little bit. If you ever sit on a stool, that's like a rotating stool, and you basically swing your arms and rotate your arms around, you'll notice that your, your, your bottom half of your body will rotate in the opposite direction. So you swing clockwise, then your the bottom part of your body will swing counterclockwise. And this is because of the fact that uh, the angular momentum is conserved, is that whenever, so when you're starting off sitting there, you're not rotating at all, so you have an angular momentum of zero, but whenever you uh, rotate the top part of your body, in a, say, in a positive direction, then the bottom part of your body would have to rotate in the opposite direction so that the total angular momentum stays at zero. Uh, because angular momentum is conserved. Um, and so let's, let's look once again in a little more detail at this. Uh, so if we want to actually find angular momentum, the symbol for angular momentum is capital L. Um, once again, don't ask me why, but that's just what it is. So angular momentum is L, it's equal to I omega, so it's the moment of inertia times the angular momentum. And once again, this should look familiar because in the same way that angular momentum is L, linear momentum is P, P is equal to M times V. Sure enough, what's the analog of mass, moment of inertia? What's the analog of velocity? It's angular velocity omega. And so these two look very similar again. So L is the angular momentum, kilogram meter squared per second. I is the moment of inertia in kilogram meter squared. And omega is the angular velocity, and that's in radians per second. Forgot to put that in there. Okay. Um, so just looking at this, we can sort of see a couple of things that, once again, sort of make some common sense, is that the magnitude of the angular momentum increases with a larger moment of inertia. And so a really heavy object that uh, you know, takes a lot of torque to get spinning uh, will continue to spin at that high torque. It's harder to stop it. It has a larger angular momentum in the same way that an object that's really heavy would have a larger uh, linear momentum whenever it's traveling here. And the second is that the angular moment or the angular momentum increases the rotation rate. An object that's rotating faster will have a higher angular momentum. Um, so those two things, once again, should be pretty straightforward in terms of how that applies here. Um, the next thing we have to look at, though, is the direction, because angular momentum, like linear momentum, is a vector. Um, you know, linear momentum we said is always in the same direction as the direct as the velocity vector. But you know, when we start talking about things that rotate, it's a little more difficult to, to you know, discuss an idea of what does it mean for something that's rotating to have a vector quantity, to have a direction to it. You know, as we said, you know, if it's a vector, it has both magnitude and direction. So to figure out the direction of the angular momentum, we, just, we use something that's called the right-hand rule. And we use the right-hand rule because it ends up following the same sort of structure that your right hand has. And so you know, if you look down in this picture, you know, right down here. You can see we have sort of an image of a right hand. You can stick your hand in front of you and get the same thing. Like you're given the thumbs up sign and have, so, you know, when you do that, if you were to basically reach your fingers out and curl your fingers around, you know, if you hold your hand with your palm facing you and then curl your fingers, is you know, you know they'll curl towards you here. But if you notice is that they basically make out sort of a circle. Uh, they go in a certain direction. If you sort of take your hand with your palm facing and now point your thumb at you and then rotate your fingers, you'll notice your fingers actually rotate in a counterclockwise direction. And so that right there, that direction that's going is basically the direction that's given by the right hand rule, is that if the direction of motion follows your fingers, then the vector that is your angular momentum vector points in the direction your thumb does. And so you can see that down here. So we have this little disc that's, uh, that's illustrated down at the bottom. And so the direction of rotation in this case is going around that way. And so if you basically take your fingers and make your fingers curl around in the same direction that rotates, you'll notice your thumb points up. And so that's what it's showing here, that this vector that is the angular momentum vector L points up because that's the direction your thumb goes when your fingers rotate that direction. Now, note that if um, we did sort of this backwards, you know, we had our object that's you know, this way, but this time instead of rotating it the way it's shown in figure A down here, we're going to rotate it the opposite direction. 
And so if we rotate this the opposite direction as we go through, if you try to take your fingers here, you notice that you know if you have your thumb pointing up and try to go this, your fingers go the wrong way. They go against the direction of motion. So instead, put your thumb down. And when your thumb is down, you'll notice that your fingers curl in the same direction as, as this arrow that we're showing here is pointing, the rotation that goes around there and goes around here, using the same type of illustration that we do in this picture right here. It's sort of the same disc. We're just sort of shifting it over. And so um, this is the right-hand rule. So overall, the right-hand rule says the direction of the angular momentum vector is at a right angle. So that's important here. You can see they show a right angle here. It's a right angle to the plane of rotation. So if the object's rotating in a certain plane, it's always at a right angle. It's, um, and it's pointing in the direction that your, uh, the thumb of your right hand would point if the fingers curl in the direction of rotation. So you f curl your fingers in the direction of rotation, and then the thumb points in a direction that the angular momentum vector would go. And it's always at a right angle to that, pl that plane of rotation. And so this seems a little, a little out there, but oh, you'll see that this ends up making a big difference in terms of figuring out what happens with angular momentum and how it's conserved. So it has both mag angular momentum has both magnitude, which we found from the last one, i times omega, and it has uh, direction, which we use the right-hand rule to figure out. So um, because of this, uh, it's important to remember that both the magnitude and the direction of the angular momentum are conserved if there's no net external torque. So uh, since the magnitude is conserved, you know, an increase in the moment of inertia of a rotating object will result in a decrease in angular velocity. You know, and that should, that should make sense because you know, if L equals I omega, if, um, if we increase the moment of inertia, then it means we'd have to decrease the angular velocity if we want to keep the angular momentum the same. And of course, the, the opposite's also true, that you know, if we uh, increase the, or decrease the moment of inertia, the angular momentum, or the, sorry, the angular velocity should increase. You know, and, and you sort of, you, you, once again, this is something that you've sort of seen here, is you ever watch figure skaters um, in the Olympics, you know, they do their spins, is they start off with their arms out, and when their arms are out, they move their mass away from their rotation axis, they've increased their moment of inertia, and so they spin, they spin at a, a normal rate, but then they pull their arms in. And when they pull their arms in, that brings the mass towards them, that lowers their moment of inertia. And if their angular momentum is conserved, since there's no net torque on them, where no, no one's spinning them while they're doing this. So the angular momentum stays the same. And so because of the fact that their uh, moment of inertia drops, their angular velocity has to increase. And so their rotation rate speeds up. And you can see that. They speed up very, very quickly um, as, they, as they go through here. And you can do this as well. If you take two like sort of hand weights, like uh, ones people use sort of to, just to work out their arms here, get in a rotating chair. And, you know, stretch your arms out holding, uh, holding those hand weights as far out as you can and then spin around and then all of a sudden pull them in. And if you have a chair that isn't very, doesn't have a lot of friction in it and so it spins freely like this, you'll notice that you spin, you spin up, you, you increase your velocity, your angular velocity, you spin a lot faster. And, you know, if you're, and then if you pull the arms, you stick your arms back out again, is that you slow down. You don't rotate as quickly. And so this is because the angular momentum of the system is conserved. Um, and so that's, uh, that's something that you have to sort of deal with because of the fact that no net torque, the angular momentum is constant. Um, the other piece is direction. So since the direction is conserved, a change in the orientation of a rotating part of an object without an external net torque will induce a change in the angular momentum of another part of the object. Uh, so that the total angular momentum is constant. So if you were to uh, do something where, once again, let's say you sit down in a chair where it's a, it's a very, no, not much friction, it rotates freely, and you were to take a bicycle wheel and spin that bicycle wheel, um, you know, and get it going here. And so once it's going, you're sitting still in the chair, but the bicycle wheel is spinning. Uh, the system that you have here of you and the bicycle wheel and the chair uh, would have a certain angular momentum. It's called basically by finding the moment of inertia of the bicycle wheel times the angular velocity of the bicycle wheel plus the moment of inertia of the chair times the angular velocity of the chair, which would be zero if you're not, you're not moving. But if you were to rotate that uh, bicycle wheel, you, if you have it in your hands and let's say the, the bicycle wheel is sort of facing up and you rotate it sideways a little bit, the chair will start spinning because when you change that angular momentum, by changing the direction of the bicycle wheel spinning, then what ends up happening is the chair has to start spinning uh, to counteract the change that you made in the angular momentum because the angular momentum has to stay the same. And so if you change the direction of the angular momentum, well, it's going to affect the system. 
um, it's sort of that's sort of the equivalent of doing one of these uh, linear momentum problems where it uh, all of a sudden starts going off in uh, you know it's an object moving in a straight line but it hits something and so it kicks off at an angle and so now you have to worry about both x and y components of your linear momentum you would also have to worry about x and y components of your angular momentum you know if you have this bicycle wheel and it's uh, let's say it's rotating in this direction this is the front up here that's the back of the bicycle wheel it's far away from you here uh, and so in that case if you use your right hand rule one uh, let's see that's going to make this velocity vector go uh, the angular momentum vector go up that's a right angle to that piece right there um, whereas we said this is the front right here and that's the back that's always the problem with drawing things in two dimensions um, so in this case is that right now the angular velocity or the angular momentum vector is all in the y direction but if I were to take this wheel and we were to rotate it now it's around like this still this is the front and that's the back back there uh, and look at the angular uh, we're still going to spin at the same rate. We have not changed the moment of inertia. We have not changed uh, omega. It's still got the same uh, rate of um, angular velocity here, but now your angular acceleration, or sorry, your um, angular momentum is in this direction. You notice now we can say, instead of it all being in the y direction, we'd say now it has both a y and an x component. So we'd say it has an lx and it has an ly. And so there's been a change in ly and there's been a change in lx. And so that means that whatever was holding this spinning wheel right here uh, would have to have the opposite. It would have to have, you know, our other object would then see uh, an, an LX in this direction right here to counteract the, the change in angular momentum right here. And instead of a positive one that goes up, we'd see, actually in this case, it would, uh, the change would actually be, uh, Let's see, actually, I think I got that backwards here. Let's see, so we'd have delta. We'd have to look at the changes. So the change in LX, so LX ended up in the positive direction, started off at zero. Uh, so the LX is z zero right here. So the change is positive. Okay, so yeah, so that change would be a positive direction right here. For LY, however, LY actually would be negative for this wheel because of the fact that originally all the momentum is, all the angular momentum is in the positive direction. Afterwards, only a component of it because the total is right here. And so now we only have the y component here, so that means that the change in angular momentum in the y direction for a wheel would be negative, okay? And so since it changes negative, that means that the other object, whatever it is, would have to have a positive change in its angular momentum. Uh, and so that would vary how the object rotated. It would make it probably want to turn itself. Um, is that so whenever you have a system of objects, no net torque is that changing the direction of the angular momentum of one of the components will affect the direction of the angular momentum of the other components and change it. Uh, so let's work out some problems on this. So take the Earth. If the Earth's radius were to contract by 1%, how much longer or shorter would a day be? Because, you know, if we're doing this without adding any no net torque. We're not uh, making the Earth spin any faster or spin any slower by applying a force or applying a torque to it. It's just contracting. Um, and so that means angular momentum is conserved. And so to find angular momentum, uh, what we're going to want to do here is we're just going to set up our angular momentum equation. So, okay, let's look at the Earth to start with. Angular momentum is I omega. And so um, given the situation, we got to find the... Um, moment of inertia of the Earth. Moment of inertia of the Earth, since it is a solid sphere, 2m squared over 5, so our 2 fifths times the mass of the Earth, which is 5.97 times 10 to the 24th kilograms, uh, times omega, uh, no, not times omega, times r squared, so the radius of the Earth is 6.37 times 10 to the 6th, quantity squared, right there, and so we can do the math on this, and we're going to get a big number. So 2 fifths times 5.97 to the 24th times 6.37 times 10 to the 6th squared, 9.6928 times 10 to the uh, 37th power, maybe the largest number we've seen in this entire course. Uh, unit still, so we have kilograms for the mass of the Earth. Meters is the unit of the radius, so kilogram meters squared, which is the unit we want right here. All right, so we have that there. Um, and then omega is, we said, radians per second. And so uh, for that one, we'd say, okay, in a day, how many radians there spin? Spins two pi radians as it goes through a full rotation. And the time in that, that's be 24 hours, 
And so we need that in seconds. So we take 24 hours times 60 minutes. So I can just, or six, uh, yeah. So a day, 24 hours times 60 minutes times 60 to get us to seconds. And so 2 pi divided by 24 divided by 60 divided by 60, 7.2722. Times 10 to the negative fifth uh, radians per second. So we've got those. We can find the angular momentum of the Earth to start with. So the beginning angular, the current angular momentum of the Earth, what it is right now, would then be the, the product of these two 9.6928 times 10 to the 37th, 37th times the angular velocity, uh, the angular velocity, yes, which is 7.2722 times 10 to the negative fifth radians per second. And so we get an initial angular, angular, angular momentum of the Earth of 7.0488 times 10 to the 33rd power. And so that's the angular momentum of the Earth to start with. Now, because of the fact there's no net torque on the Earth, we're just contracting the radius in a little bit, uh, that angular momentum will remain constant. So that will also be our final angular momentum of the Earth. But in the second case is that the mass of the Earth stays the same, but the radius is different. And so, you know, we're going to have to find a new angular momentum, or sorry, a new moment of inertia. And so um, two-fifths times the mass of the Earth, which hasn't changed, 5.97 times 10 to the 24th times the new radius of the Earth. Now it says it's, uh, it's contracted by 1%, which means the radius is 99% of what it was before. So we'll just say 0.99 times the existing radius, which is 6.37 times 10 to the sixth, and then square that. And so we do that, just do the math on it, uh, comes out 9.5, almost on the dots, what I'm getting. So 9.500 times 10 to the 37th. So in looking at our angular momentum is that it's dropped a little bit. It's 9.69 times 10 to the 37th. Now it's 9.5. And so that makes sense. The Earth is, is contracted, so it means that uh, the, radio, the, Earth's not, uh, the mass is not as spread out as it was before, and so that would lower the moment of inertia. And so let's go ahead and try to figure out the remainder of this, because we know that the, uh, the angular velocity, or the, sorry, the angular momentum, is still saying the same, 7.0488, 7.0488. Eight. I don't know why this thing's not showing up here. So eight eight. That is not uh, another decimal right there. So we can get rid of that. Seven point oh four eight eight times ten to the thirty third. Thirty third. Wow. Uh, should equal to in this case I or in the new case, which is our nine point five oh oh times ten to the thirty thirty seventh times omega, which is what we're looking for here. All right, so we can divide both sides by 9.500 times 10 to the 37th. And so when we do that, I get an omega, which is equal to 7.41, uh, 985 times 10 to the negative fifth. All right, so we have our omega here. And so looking at the original omega, which was 7.27 times the negative fifth, now we get 7.41. Angular, um, angular velocity is a little higher uh, than it was before, which means the Earth is spinning a little faster in this case, which makes sense. We never talked about the figure scare. They pull their arms in, lower their moment of inertia, and that would increase their rotation rate. Same thing happens here. So we'd expect the Earth the day will be a little shorter than it was before. So we've already established now that the day is going to be shorter. Next question is how much shorter? Well, omega is radians per second. So the Earth is still spinning 2 pi in a day. Uh, but the time, we don't know. And so that should be equal to our 7.41985 times 10 to the negative fifth radians per second. So uh, multiply the t up, divide 2 pi by 7.41985, gives us a t of 84680.7 seconds. We convert that to hours, so uh, divide that by... Um, Let's see, divided by 3,600, because that'll give us, divided by 60 will give us minutes, divided by another 60 gives us hours. And so T ends up being 23.52 hours. And so subtract that from 
0.47758 hours, then times six to get minutes, that's 28.65 minutes. And so the day would be 28.65 minutes shorter if we, uh, the Earth were to contract its radius by 1%. Even a very small change in the Earth's radius makes a, uh, a noticeable difference in the length of the day. And so uh, sig fig wise, uh, I guess all these are constants. So, or, except for the 1%, so I guess maybe 30 minutes would be your best answer if you're doing this in minutes here. But that would be a way that we could sort of see that mo angular momentum is conserved. So uh, let's take a look at just some more, um, just general uh, problems, not necessarily calculation problems, but let's look at how things change whenever we start changing uh, angular momentum uh, for an object that has no net torque. So here we have a helicopter. We have three different views of our helicopter from the, the side, from the top, from the front. And so let's say the, the helicopter's rotor blades spin counterclockwise when viewed from the top. And so we're looking at, we'll look at the middle picture, which from here. And so if they're counterclockwise, the rotor blades are going to spin in this direction right here. And so um, the question is, what happens to the body of the helicopter when the blades increase their speed? So um, first thing, let's look at the uh, angular momentum of these rotational blades. And so, you know, looking at the picture in the middle where we're looking at the helicopter from the top, we're going to apply our right hand rule. And so when we apply our right hand rule, we take our right hand, we wrap our fingers and curl them in the direction that the rotor blade is turning. And so in that case, when I do that, my thumb points out towards me. It points out of the screen right here. And so the, the way that, just, just as a note here, um, I don't know if we mentioned this before, but the way you actually show vectors that point out or in is uh, a vector that points out. You do with a circle with a dot in the middle of it, like you're seeing um, the uh, like the point of the arrow. If it were going in, then what you do is you would do a little X through it, like you're seeing the tail feathers. That would be a vector that's going into the screen, versus uh, this would be a vector that goes out of out of the screen right there. And so in this case, is that this um, this angular velocity vector because of the fact we use a right hand rule for the rotating rotor blades would point up towards us in the middle picture. If we were looking at this in the top picture, we we're looking at the aircraft from the, uh, the helicopter from the side, the angular uh, velocity or the angular uh, momentum would be going that way because in this case that the rotor blade spinning would be so the, the rotor blades would be spinning so that uh, this piece right here, since it's going down like this direction, this piece here is going to be coming out at you. This part right here is going to be going away from you on that end. And so the angular the angular, ah, angular momentum would be upward because once again we take our right hand, we wrap it so that our fingers on this side right here uh, go in, will go into the board. The ones over here, they come out of the board and our thumb goes up. In the case of the picture that's on the bottom where the helicopter is facing us is in that case, that's so at this point right here, it's coming towards us, so that would mean that on the uh, from the helicopter perspective, on the right side from the helicopter's perspective would be coming towards us. The left side would be going away from us, and then the angular uh, angular momentum would once again wrap our right hands. We see that's pointing up in that direction here. So okay, so this is our situation to start with here. That's the direction of the angular um, angular momentum. Now in this case, it says the blades are going to increase their speed, and so if they speed up, they're going the same direction. Uh, so uh, that means that since our angular momentum is I omega, we have not changed anything about the moment of inertia of the blades. They weigh the same amount, their distribution is the same place here, but we have made uh, omega go up. And so um, in that case is that since we're not changing I, we're making omega go up, is the angular momentum must go up of the blades. Now the problem is, is that the total angular momentum of the whole helicopter has to stay the same. And so if we make the angular momentum of the blades go up, then we would have to make the angular momentum of the whole helicopter go down by the same amount to compensate for it. And so whatever the change in angular momentum of the blades would have to be equal to the negative change of the angular momentum of the helicopter body right here. And so if that were true, then that would mean, you know, just thinking about this, that the since uh, we have an increase in angular momentum, so the angular momentum, uh, our delta angular momentum for the, the helicopter blades, sorry, I'm going to change my color on that, uh, get rid of that here, I'll use green for the blades and blue for the, the helicopter body. So the change in, in momentum here is going to be positive right here, which would mean that for the helicopter body, the change in momentum would have to be negative, and so it's going to go from zero to being down like this. And so, well, if that angular momentum is down, 
then once again we're gonna apply the right hand rule. So stick your thumb down and you know and then wrap your wrap your fingers around it. And what you notice is by sticking your thumb down in this case is that it causes that uh, the rotation is exactly the opposite direction to that of the helicopter blades. And so for uh, for our rotation here is that our fingers will go into the board here. And so for the helicopter, it would go into the board here and then rotate all the way around on the back side of the helicopter. It would come out, which would be, uh, so that means on the front part of the helicopter is that it's going this way. On the back part, it's going this way. And so it would cause the helicopter's body to start rotating in the opposite direction of the blades when the blades sped up. Um, now, obviously, this would not be a very good thing if you're in this helicopter. And so that's the reason why helicopters have the back rotor that's on here. That back rotor can, you know, so in the case of the picture that's sort of in the middle here, is that because of the fact that uh, that it wants to rotate and the, the tail wants to rotate in that direction, is that we would basically change the velocity of this to act a counter force that would go in the opposite direction, push the helicopter back there to straighten it out. And so changing the, the speed of the upper rotor blades, the ones that keep the helicopter in the air, have to be countered by uh, applying basically a net torque. That's what these back blades do, is they apply a torque in the opposite direction so that the, the body doesn't start spinning whenever you change the speed of the rotation of the, of the, of the rotor blades. Uh, so that's something that you have to take into to account here. So that would be an example, uh, not including the back rotor, back here, uh, is the way that the body rotates whenever we increase the speed of the blades uh, as an example of conservation of angular momentum. Now, of course, if we decrease the speed of the blades, then the opposite would happen, um, is that then our delta uh, L for this would be negative for this, uh, and then that would mean our delta L for the other one would be positive, and so then the blade, then the helicopter would uh, start rotating, the body of the helicopter would rotate in the opposite direction, and so we'd have to counter it with a, with a torque back in the other direction using the, the, uh, the, tail, the tail rotor. So let's look at this where we not just change the magnitude, but we change the direction. So same situation here, but this time, uh, so the helicopter's rotor blades still are spinning in a counterclockwise direction back around like this. Uh, but this time, what happens to the body of the helicopter when the blades tilt forward? So originally, we had a... Um, since they're spinning, uh, since the blades are spinning um, uh, counterclockwise from the top, we said that we're going to get uh, an angular momentum that goes up, sort of out towards us from the perspective of the middle helicopter. It goes up from the perspective of what we have in the second helicopter, in the top helicopter right here. But now what we're going to do is we're going to change the rotation, the tilt of the rotor blades. And so I'm going to exaggerate a little bit, but if helicopter wants to fly forward, what it does is it tilts its rotator, its blades, so that now they're basically sort of in this new plane. And when we do that, that is going to change basically where our, um, our angular acceleration points, because originally it was straight up, but now it's going to be perpendicular to that plane, right? It always has to be perpendicular. And so it's going to be this direction right here. So um, let's, let's just take a look and zoom out on that and take a look at what this would mean. You know, if our original angular momentum was, was pointing up with this magnitude, and now our new angular momentum is angled over, it has the same magnitude in both cases here. But, you know, if you actually break this down, what you can see is that there's been a change because the new angular momentum has both an x and a y component. Is, and if we look at the change in this, then you know we can actually sort of set this up. So let's look at, um, for the purposes of doing this, let's look at our change in uh, the angular momentum of the rotor in the x direction, and let's look at the change in the angular momentum of the rotor in the y direction. And let's just, for right now, we're not going to look at numbers, let's just look at whether it's positive or negative. So um, for the rotor in the x direction, the original angular momentum of the rotor in the x direction was zero because if you look at that green vector that's right here that points straight up, it has no x component, and but it ends up with an x component that goes off, you know, this direction like here. And so if we call this the positive direction going off to the left in this case, then we'd mean that we'd have an increase in our uh, angular momentum in the x direction whenever we tilt those blades forward. Now for, and that's not a plus, that's just a positive right there. Now in the y direction, on the other hand, is that, you know, originally the whole angular momentum was pointing in the y direction, but now only part of it is. And so, you know, if you look at this, that means there's been a change in that, and that change is negative. And so it means that the change in the y direction uh, of the rotor's angular momentum is negative. But what do we know? We know that if there is no net torque, and so we're not considering any net torque that's in here, that means that if we look now 
at the um, angular momentum of the helicopter. And so we'll look at the helicopter in the x direction, change in angular momentum of the helicopter in the y direction. Well, the total angular momentum in the x direction has to stay the same because there's no net torque. And so that means that if the uh, rotor's angular momentum went up, had a positive change, then the helicopter's body has to go in the opposite direction, has to cancel it out, so that the total angular momentum stays the same. And the same thing is true on the y direction, is if the rotor's angular momentum change was negative, it means the uh, helicopter's body's angular momentum change has to be positive. So let's see what that means. Um, so looking at this from this side angle right here, looking at the helicopter's body's change in angular momentum is we said that in the, um, in the x direction, the angular momentum is going to be negative, and so negative be pointed back here. And so that means we're going to have a new induced angular momentum that's going to go back that direction. That's our Lx. And then it says it's going to be the positive direction for y, and so it's going to see an angular momentum that's going to be in this direction for y. So we have another one that goes back over there. So let's see what this does. Let's look at just x first. And so we want to apply our right hand rule. And so stick your thumb in the direction of that x component. So that's going to go back. And when that does that, you'll notice that what it does is that means that the top part, if you just curl your fingers around that, you see at the top of the helicopter, your fingers come towards you. And at the bottom of the helicopter, your fingers go away from you. And so that would mean that the top part of the helicopter comes towards you. And so we're going to draw that right there. And the bottom part of the helicopter goes away from you. It'll be a little bit like this. So if we look at this from the front, so we're going to go down the front. We haven't looked at that a whole lot. We said the top part of it goes towards you in the top picture, which would be going to the helicopter's left. And so that means that uh, we're looking at it from the front here. Um, let's make sure I'm getting it right. Yep, it would be going off the helicopter's left. So we'd see a rotation in this direction here. And on the bottom, it's going away from us down there, which means we'd see a rotation down here. So this, this would basically, this helicopter would have a tendency, whenever the rotor's foot forward, to rotate, so sort of to tilt over and flip towards its side. And so once again, that's not something that you'd want in a helicopter. We'd have to balance that out probably by using a tail rotor or using some other factor here. But so that's the first thing. So that's the consequence of just looking at the X change of momentum. Let's look at the Y change of momentum. So the Y change of momentum for the helicopter body is going up. It's in the positive direction. So let's stick our thumb in the upward direction and then curl our fingers around. And when you do that, what you find is that your fingers go into the bore, into the screen, basically on the back side of the helicopter. And so they go away at the back side of the helicopter. On the front side of the helicopter, we wrap around from behind the helicopter and our fingers come forward on the front side of the helicopter. And so that would come up like this. And so that would mean that in terms of doing this here, the back side of the helicopter is going to start rotating in this direction. The front side of the helicopter is going to start rotating in this direction. Our helicopter would basically, from its perspective, uh, let's see, did I do that right? Let's see, it would make a left turn. Am I looking at this right here? Uh, I thought it was supposed to come out of a right turn in this case. Okay, so let's see if the uh, change is negative in the helicopter, in the rotors in the y direction because uh, it went down, so therefore it must be positive in the x direction uh, for the change in this right here, and so that means it's going to be an increase in that direction, and so our fingers go in at that point and out at this point. So yeah, it looks like the helicopter would basically then start showing a leftward turn, and so whenever the rotors butt forward here. And so you can see from this that just a change in the orientation of something that rotates can result in changes in the orientation of other parts of the system if there's no net torque on it. Uh, and so that's something as a helicopter pilot you have to deal with pretty often. Um, the same thing happens with, uh, with rotored airplanes is that whenever they start lifting their nose, they will see a rotation. The plane will chart to start to turn to the right or to the left once they, once they change that, uh, depending on um, whether they're tilting the nose up or tilting the nose down. And so and that has to do with maintaining this conservation of angular momentum. Even if the magnitude stays the same, if the direction changes, that can affect other aspects.